Hello, I'm Rory McKiernan and welcome to the Love and Courage podcast. This is a community supported podcast made possible by donors and patrons like you. You can help the podcast grow by subscribing to it, leaving a review and a rating and by spreading the word wherever you can. You can also support by becoming a donor or a patron and receive a Love and Courage t-shirt, badge, special mentions online and discounts on future workshops and events. You can find out more at loveandcourage.org. Thanks so much for your support. It really means a lot and is hugely appreciated. I hope you enjoy the podcast. You know, I want my grandchildren to be able to say, well, hey, Grandpa, you, you work for the CIA, you know? What's, what's it like to torture people? I want to be able to say, look, I had nothing to do with that. Here's what I did. Let me tell you what I tried to do. 77-year-old New Yorker Ray McGovern is a veteran CIA officer turned peace activist. He was a CIA analyst from 1963 to 1990, including during the administrations of John F. Kennedy, Ronald Reagan and George Bush Sr. Ray's duties included chairing national intelligence estimates and preparing the president's daily brief. He received the Intelligence Commendation Medal on his retirement, returning it in 2006 in protest at US involvement in torture. In 2011, during a speech at George Washington University by Hillary Clinton, McGovern stood silently with his back turned during her remarks. This led him to being arrested and badly beaten while the Secretary of State continued her speech about the need for freedom of expression in Iran and in Egypt. Ray was later added to the State Department's diplomatic security list of potential threats. In 2013, McGovern, along with three former winners, gave the Sam Adams Award for Integrity and Intelligence to Edward Snowden. It was clear when I met Ray that he still has a real fire in his belly. With a true passion for truth and justice, he's a man on a mission, as you're about to hear. Ray, thanks very much for joining me on the Love and Courage podcast. Um, I was just reading there, your surname is obviously McGovern, and I did a little bit of research online and I saw McGovern. I thought, geez, I'm from County Cavan in the northeast of Ireland, mm-hmm. very small region. McGovern, the surname seems to come from there. Mm-hmm. You go to Wikipedia and you see McGovern associated with the other surname, McKiernan. Mm-hmm. So we ah, may be related. <laughs> <laughs> so God knows what we were up to back in the day, yeah. maybe hundreds of years ago, the McGoverns and McKiernans could have been could have been peace campaigners or organizers. We don't know. Organizers, probably. Probably, <laughs> probably. And uh, could you tell me a bit about your heritage and what you know of it? Oh, sure. Uh, Townland Tully Minister. Uh, in, in Cavan, that's where my grandfather was was brought up. Came to this, uh, came to the America in about eight, about uh, eighteen ninety nine. Met my grandmother, who was from Galway, Woodford, and uh, actually he came on the next ship. Uh, she came from from Cork, from Cork, from Queensland or Cove, and he came from Belfast. And they found out that he came on the next ship, so she, she accused him of following her all the way from Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> they get married, uh, produced my father, lived in the Bronx. He was a letter carrier. And uh, I didn't know him very well, but uh, we grew up with my grandmother. And uh, I had a special relationship with my grandmother for when my elder brother uh, got very sick with spinal meningitis, a long, prolonged illness of death. She was my surrogate mother for many, many months, and uh, and I just uh, still find myself not only quoting from her, but uh, acting uh, according to the way she taught me. One of the big uh, slogans was, uh, show me your company and I'll tell you who you are, okay? And as I look around at the company I keep now, I think uh, Jane Fahey is looking down. So not bad, not bad at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And could you tell me a bit more about her life and what maybe influenced her and where her values came sure. from? Well, she was one of 10 and she was a girl. And so in 1888, at the age of 18, her father packed up a little lunch bag, you know, for the, for the week long journey to, to New York and said goodbye to Jane. All she had was the address of, a, of an aunt who was a seamstress and who had uh, an inn with a seamstress uh, factory. And uh, so Jane Fahey learned how to sew and was lucky enough to get a job with a very well-to-do woman. 
traveled all around the, the then known world, actually, the parish exposition and so forth. And she told the story. She, the, the woman's name was uh, Neil, Miss Neeland, okay? And uh, it was 1900. And Miss Neeland said, Jane, how long has it been since you've been home? And she said, 12 years. She said, well, take the overnight ferry there and, and go see your folks. So she's sitting in Woodford and in the one, one room cottage there with her brothers and sisters. And one of her sisters says, now, Jane, uh, the word is that Miss Neeland had 13 pieces of luggage. Is that true? And my grandmother said, yeah, true. She says, well, what, what in the world would she be needing 13 pieces of luggage for? And the Irish father, knowing all the answers, of course, said, well, for uh, provisions for the journey. <laughs> he, having set his little daughter off with his little lunch bag, and, of course, a rich lady would need 13 pieces of luggage to have all the food along that they, they might need. So she came from very humble uh, backgrounds, but uh, very strong ethos, and uh, she taught me a lot about uh, how, uh, how the world, what the world is like. Um, another little vignette. I'm going out to my first job, caddying on the golf course, okay? 14 years old, she says, Raymond, you're going to be working with the upper crust. And do you know what the upper crust is? I said, well, yeah, sure. She said, you don't know. You don't know. Sit down now. Now, I tell you, the upper crust, Raymond, is a bunch of crumbs held together by a lot of dough. So you need to know that. And if you know that and remember it, you'll be all right on the golf course. <laughs> And you know what? <laughs> I did remember it, and it was okay on the golf course, and I was okay with the presidents and the secretaries of states and all of them, because, uh, as she used to warn us, I didn't put on the high hat. Can you tell me a little bit about your childhood, say your formative years around maybe the age of, say, 13, 14? Oh, sure, yeah. I, uh, I uh, grew up in the Bronx, and uh, in those days there was about... 30% Irish, 20% Italian, 40% Jewish, and really wonderful polyglot kind of atmosphere. Uh, I was Catholic, I still am, and uh, when I was baptized, uh, we used to say that uh, not only was membership in the Catholic Church conferred, but membership in the local union and membership in the Democratic Party, okay? <laughs> That's a joke, of course, uh, but I... I grew up with my father very much supporting Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He thought he was the best gift that God had given our country at the time, and I'm, I agree with that. Uh, but I no longer uh, consider, I, you know, I can't get out of the Catholic Church. There's no way to sign out, nor would I want to. But I have signed out of the Democratic Party since it's lost its roots. When I asked my father, what's the difference between a Democrat and a Republican? He said, very simple, Ray. He said the Democrats care about the poor people. Mm. And was that around the same time you started that caddying and hanging around with the upper crust? Yes, yeah, it was a nice little uh, exposure to, to, to both worlds. And, and later, as I studied theology and, uh, and business, actually, uh, it became very clear to me that uh, there was this justice thing, right? Okay. And as far as the Hebrew or the Christian scriptures are concerned, it became crystal clear that this God of ours, whether it's Yahweh or Jesus, cared really only about one thing, and that was that we do justice, you know. The rest was all sort of accidental, you know. And, uh, and that really sort of dawned on me as, as something that uh, was so key that I needed to, uh, to guide my behavior accordingly. And, uh, and it was then that I started working in the inner city. And uh, when my profession, my former profession of intelligence analysis became corrupted, deliberately corrupted in such a way as to justify a bogus war on Iraq, I formed a, a little group of former intelligence analysts. And we uh, tried to we tried to uh, make sure that something was out there uh, in the media to tell our former colleagues that we were watching them and that we saw what they were doing and we were going to hold them accountable. 
We wrote three such memoranda before the war in Iraq. We couldn't get any media exposure, so, uh, well, nobody could get any media exposure except those that were drumming the drums for war. And I see the same thing happening now, which is a very dangerous thing because now we don't have a, a country without an army. We have the, the Russia, and Russia is uh, somebody, some country that's going to defend its, what it considers to be its national interests. Russia has obviously been a big interest in your life. Where where did your interest in Russia start? Was that at university or studies? It was, yeah. Um, I had uh, studied under the Jesuits uh, for my uh, high school years, and then I went to Fordham University, Jesuit University. So I was up to here with uh, Greek and Latin, and I had some French, and French was okay, but... Uh, to do the foreign language, the modern foreign language uh, uh, requirement, you had to take uh, language. Well, I was finished with French, so they were offering Russian. And they had a very strong Russian department at Fordham. This was late 50s. And so... And this is co Cold War period yeah, as well. Yeah, so it's yeah, quite really new. getting bad, yeah. So um, I decided to major in Russian, learned the language well enough to teach it, and took my master's degree in Russian. And uh, initially I didn't know why I was doing that, just because I liked it. It was fun and I'm good at languages. But of course then we had uh, Berlin and we had Cuba and we had all manner of things with the Russians. And so after I was commissioned in the army, I did my two years in military intelligence and there was a natural progression to become an analyst. So did you join the military straight out of university? I did. I was commissioned in what we call ROTC, which is the Reserve Officer Training Course. Mm -hmm. And had that been something that was appealing to you, or was it just sort of happenstance, or how well, did it all come about? Well, it was about? sort of a mix. Um, in those days, there was a universal draft. In those days, there were high tensions. So you were likely as not to be drafted. And so the question for someone privileged enough to go to college was, uh, if, I, if I'm going to serve, should I aspire to serve in a responsible officer capacity as a leader, or shall I just wait and take my chances and get drafted? So many of us decided to enroll in the Reserve Officer Training Corps. It was four years. Uh, it involved pretty rigorous summer camp. And then we were commissioned when we graduated to, with our bachelor's degree. What were your first experiences off the military when you joined? <laughs> well, uh, they put off my call to active duty uh, for a year until I got my master's degree, and I thought that was pretty wide of them. Of course, the master's degree was in Russian studies, and they expected that they would be able to profit from that. Uh, but I was called to active duty on the 3rd of November, 1962. And like all bright-eyed, bushy-tailed officers, we were eager to learn about these new weapons, like the grenade launcher that we heard so much about. But when we got to Fort Benning, the Army Infantry School, there were no weapons there to train on. And so I made some modest inquiries as a young second lieutenant, and I was told, well, yeah, there were two divisions came through here four weeks ago, took all the weapons we have to Key West, right opposite Cuba, they were about to go in. Now there's a, a sort of palpable, a tangible exposure to how close we were to a war that probably would have ended all of us, right? Now that was 1962. How old were you around the stage? I was 23. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying here is if you do the arithmetic, 2016, 1962, that's a long time ago, and there are very few people as old as I am who remember how, how close we were. We intelligence people didn't know that those missiles that the Russians put into Cuba were armed with nuclear warheads. We found that out 20 years later, right? So it was a miracle, really. It was, it was John Kennedy and Khrushchev who decided, look, this is crazy. You know, this is really crazy. Let's... Let's make a deal, and of course the deal was take the missiles out of Turkey, we'll take the missiles out of Cuba, and it was, uh, so we were so close then. And the reason I mention this is we're close now, but nobody remembers then. Then was then. That's not even part of the history. These young people, young people, sophomores I would call them, who were advising President Obama. 
And there aren't too many people in Europe who have been around long enough to realize how dangerous this is. Russia has national interests. They were invaded several times, like by Napoleon, right? By Hitler, by the Swedes, by the Poles, by, by the Lithuanians, right? Going back centuries. And they all came through the same place where we're having exercises with 31,000 NATO troops now. Why? Why? So, you know, if uh, Mr. Putin in the Kremlin is upset about this, I can understand that. Why would this be happening? And uh, the best I can figure out is what Pope Francis called the blood-soaked arms makers, the blood-drenched arms traders. I mean, peace is not very good for business, right? War, really good for business, and people make a heck of a lot of money, not only in the United States, but in Europe, making armaments and feeding on these tensions, which in my view, and I have some experience in this, are artificially stoked. And tell me more about that specific experience in that. So w did you end up being based in Russia for some time? And No, um, when I left the army, I came on to CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia, as an analyst. And was that a specific choice or were you co-opted or no, encouraged? I had, or? I had put out feelers on my own initiative because I had heard about the analysis activities of the CIA. It was pretty new, you know, 1947 was set up, so we're just talking about you know, 15 years. And they advertised the fact that uh, into my inbox as, a, uh, as an analyst, and I have, to, I have to sort of persuade the college kids today that we actually had boxes made out of wood, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what our inboxes look. So all kinds of material would come in there from open sources, from spies, from overhead photography, from intercepts, from the State Department, FBI. It would all come into one box, right? And I would be... Now, get this. This is not a, a word that's allowed in Washington vocabulary anymore, but it, I would be accountable. I would be responsible. I would have to sort through this, and if there were a story in there, I needed to write that up for the president. For the president? Yeah, right, for the president, because we worked right under the president. That's what Truman set up. He didn't want to put us under the Pentagon, where the Russians were always 10 feet tall, right? Or the State Department, they were always defending their own policy. So it turned out to be true. What I could do, and what I did do, my, my account was Russian policy toward China, Vietnam, Southeast Asia, and the international communist movement. So what I would do is to sift through this, write up a story, and um, maybe every month, every six weeks or so, since it was Russia, since it was the Soviet Union, it would get onto the president's desk. Now, did they fiddle with it up the line? Well, it, you know, I'm not a real good speller, <laughs> and sometimes my syntax isn't really good, but if they agreed with my line of analysis, we go straight to them, and and that was that was heady, because we had no agenda other than to tell truth to power, and people can't believe that. You go to Washington, and say, you know, I worked in a place that had no agenda except to speak the truth, so the president couldn't know what's going on, and they say, right, you know, right, their eyes glaze over. <laughs> you got to have an agenda, you know, but we didn't, and that's why that's why I feel so strongly, and watching this ethos is speaking truth to power, corrupted, prostituted really, when George Bush, Dick Cheney, and my former colleagues let themselves be, well, my former colleagues let themselves be suborned into not mistaken intelligence. It was fraud. It was out-and-out -out fraud that justified the war in Iraq. That was too much. That's why we formed our little alumni group that's why we keep publishing. We're up to our 45th memorandum, mostly to the president. And over a period of 15 years, that's only about three a year, as I understand. And, uh, and they've always been at, at crucial junctures. Some of them were written to uh, Chancellor Merkel, saying, look, <laughs> don't believe General Strangelove there. In the, not Miss Strangelove, whatever it comes, Strangelove. General Breedlove. Uh, we know now from his emails that he was working behind the scenes to start a war in Ukraine. So that's a big question, how much control our president has 
over our military. Were there times during that stage, during that period of your life where you did encounter information or see information that you felt uncomfortable with? And as you progressed in your career, um, at what point did the tensions emerge where you understood that the machine that was operating in and above you and your conscience, where were they in alignment or out of alignment? Well, I have to divide that into two because first and foremost, people have to realize there are two CIAs, one, two, okay. The one I worked in is the analysis directorate. That's the one that I described speaking truth to power. The other one is the operations directorate. Uh, those are the ones that uh, overthrow governments. Those are the ones that torture people. Those are the ones that, uh, not in my day, we were vaguely aware that those things were going on. Now, in the new headquarters building, which was built just before I came on duty with John John Kennedy as president, there were turnstiles. The operations people couldn't come to the anal- analysts. The analysts couldn't go. So it was really two buildings as well as two CIAs. So what I knew about what was going on, particularly in places like Latin America, where terrible things were going on, sometimes by some of the people that I'd gone through training with, you know, I didn't know that, their names or anything. This was under the Reagan administration? Well, no, this is earlier on. This right. is, you know, under LBJ, under Lyndon Johnson and Nixon and all the rest of them. Uh, the point is simply that what I, what I knew about that at the time was what I read in the New York Times. And there was a lot in the New York Times. Now, how did I, how did I deal with that? Well, I never worked on Latin America, for example. And as long as I could tell the president or at least my superiors, the truth, I felt that it was best for me to stay in place and just do my job. And, and on Vietnam, for example, tell the president this was a fool's errand, that if he was worried about the Russians, <laughs> the big shibboleth there was, uh, the Russians have a lot of influence in Hanoi and we can get them, this is Harriman, you know, the, the guys that can do anything. You know. We get the Russians to pull our chestnuts out of the fire. We get the Russians to tell the North Vietnamese, stop, stop. <laughs> you know, if you knew anything about the history of Vietnam, you knew that the Russians had sold the Vietnamese down the, down the, the river at 54, 1954, the Geneva Conference. And the Vietnamese would never even, never trust the Russians again. And so the Russians had zero influence in that. Did they give them some Sam, you know, any aircraft? Well, yeah. But that was just to burnish their reputation as you know, anti-imperialists. They had no influence. So I kept trying to tell Harriman and the others, look, if you're dependent on the Russians to pull a chestnut out of the fire in Hanoi, forget about it. They, they, not only have they no incentive to do that, but they don't have the ability to do it. Now, that's the second part of the, the, your answer here. That was frustrating because sometimes uh, the guys at the very top, like... Uh, director Richard Helms, um, they didn't want to cross the U.S. military. And sometimes the real truth didn't get very far, didn't get as far as the White House, particularly on Vietnam. Can you identify with the likes of Edward Snowden now, because he was a young man, or he is a young man rather, around the same age you were during a lot of this going on. And he specifically, he's obviously now ended up in Russia. but he would have had access to information and at some point his conscience caused him to, uh, and I know you work on this, you work on, I think you teach a course in, in the area of whistleblowing. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you feel a particular empathy towards him, a particular affinity? I would say respect. Uh, he, at the same age I was, had the courage to see that the oath that he took to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, was being violated willy-nilly. We have a Fourth Amendment which says you can't snoop on people without a court warrant. You have to have probable cause. He saw that violated willy-nilly, okay? Now, the Constitution of the United States, something I carry around with me, right? It's the only oath we take We don't take an oath to keep secret information classified. We take an oath to defend this Constitution. And and Ed Snowden, and I know him well now, I've seen him twice, we gave him an award in in Moscow in 2013. 
Uh, he's the real deal. And he said, look, somebody's got to do this. And when I asked him, I said, well, you know, how do you feel about uh, this woman that went to Forbes magazine and said, uh, you know, I don't know uh, whether Snowden did the right thing, but I really resent the character assassin. He's the greatest guy. The reason he had access to everything, he was the only new guy that could could cope with this. And besides, he defended us when our bosses came down. And, and so uh, I asked, uh, last time I was with him in Moscow, I said, do you know about that? And he said, yeah, my people tell me when those things happen. I said, well, how do you feel about that? You know what he said? He says, well, Ray, I knew somebody had to do this. And I looked around the room and I saw Margie, she, she got a, a big new mortgage. John has some kids in college. And, and I said, you know, uh, I guess that would be me. <laughs> you know? uh, oh, okay, Ed, you know. Yeah, if that were me, you know, I would have said, yeah, all these guys knew they were violating the Constitution. I'm the only, only guy that had the guts to, you know, but none of that, none of that. So Ed Snowden has one big problem, right? And that is, he is literally too good to believe. Altruistic, principled, willing to put his life on the line. Yeah, all those things. And that's somehow too good to believe for most Americans. So they say, oh, you ended up in Russia. We never intend to be in Russia. So, yeah, Ed Snowden is a guy I, I admire greatly, all the more so because at his age I had a chance to do that on Vietnam, and I didn't. That takes about three more minutes to tell, but I'd be happy to tell it if, if you have that. Please do, yeah. Okay. All right, I was working on Soviet policy toward Vietnam. One of my best friends named Sam Adams, actually a direct descendant of John Adams, about 13 times removed, really sharp guy out of Harvard, uh, an analyst uh, that they put on the account for counting up uh, Vietnamese communists under arms. And he was an incredible analyst. He got all this material, you know, he, I talked about an inbox. He had a, he had a big table and he collated all this and he realized, came to the conclusion there were 500,000 to 600,000 communists under arms in South Vietnam. And then he found out that General Westmoreland, the commander of our forces there, was only saying 299,000. And so this was, you know, this was twice as many. So he went over to Saigon and fought it out. He said, well, this regiment has 200 people. No, no, we only carry 100. Well, this battalion, that, that has 300. No, no. And they were just having the things. And so, in a bar that night, and one of the sergeants came up, he's now Mr. Adams, <laughs> he had a couple of beers, he said, you, you might as well just go home because John Westmore is not going to allow any more than 299,000, that's just it, you know? So you go home. Now, what was the problem? The problem was we were killing so many Vietnamese every week that even though the press in Saigon was not you know, the brightest, they could do arithmetic, right? So. How are you going to tell the press in Vietnam what the real story was? Namely, that we're facing twice as many, twice as many communists under arms. So, on August 19th, no, on August 20th, 1967, I remember it well, I had lunch with Sam Adams, and I said, Sam, I don't understand. How can it be that the commander of our forces in Vietnam wants to reduce the number of enemy that he faces. I mean, traditionally, if you're facing you're in a war, you're going to exaggerate the enemy size. And he says, Ray, look, he says, I told you before, it's too difficult a problem with the media if you, if you recognize what the problem is. As a matter of fact, this morning, we got a cable in from Saigon. It's from General Abrams, after whom they named the Abrams tank. He was a really good tanker in World War II not so bright politically, because he wrote in this cable, he was deputy to Westmoreland, who was out of, out of town at the time, he said, uh, we can't possibly admit to the greater numbers of enemy troops in South Vietnam, because we have been, this is a direct quote, we have been projecting an image of success in this war. And there's nothing that we can say by way of extenuating circumstances or or other phraseology that will prevent the press from drawing an erroneous and gloomy conclusion, period, 
end quote. He put that in writing, okay? Now, the only way you get to see this cable was the director's office is called no dis, which means no dissemination, right? So I, and McGovern's thinking, my God, that, that, there it is, you know? 1967, we had already lost about 22,000 uh, GIs, and, you know, Vietnamese are human beings too. There are probably a million already killed there. So McGovern thinks, now, Sam Adams is such a straight arrow, he's never going to go to the press with this, but you should, Ray, you should. Now, you have to realize that in those days, the New York Times was an independent newspaper, and if you gave them documentary evidence, they would put it on their front page, you know, it's not like now. So I, I toyed with this idea. I said, you know, I think I could probably persuade Sam under some ruse to get me a copy of that thing. Go down to the New York Times, Washington Bureau. Maybe I could stop this damn thing. Then I said, mm, but I now I have a big mortgage. I have three kids and I have prospects of uh, advancement here. I have an assignment in Western Europe coming up. I'll wait until I have more gravitas until I become a senior manager and then next time this happens so it's the, all the rationalizations right so I I didn't do nothing I didn't do anything and so that's one reason why when I see people like Ed Snowden and I see people come out of the woodwork at great risk to themselves doing the right thing I say well at least you could do now McGovern ex post facto is to support them to the hilt and that's what I'm trying to do. I, th I think so many people encounter abuses or injustices or are privy to things that happen in their personal lives, in their community, nationally and internationally. What do you think it is, that internal dialogue that goes on, that either prevents somebody from acting or forces, compels someone into action? Is that, is that just the, you know, where we get into the black and white of courage, fear and yeah. courage? I'd say uh, it comes out of my faith experience, really. Um, I'm pretty well versed in biblical scholarship and so forth. I have a certificate in theology from Georgetown University not, not too long ago. But in simplest terms, um, a Jesuit at Fordham put it this way, and he actually ended up uh, down in El Salvador working with the, the poor there, there in Salvador. His name was Dean Brackley, and he wrote in a very simple way, although he's a, a theologian of some note, he said, you know, it all depends on who you think God is and how God feels when little people get pushed around. Now, I'm from the Bronx, and I work in the inner city now, and I see how little people get pushed around. <clears throat> and I see these, what we call our volunteer <laughs> army, right? These are young kids from the inner city, or from the towns in this country, in, in America, that have less than 50,000 people, you know? It's not volunteer, that's a poverty draft. They have no job opportunity, they have no education opportunity. They sign up for a couple of years in, in hopes that they, or actually for a career, but usually they say, you know, 20 years, then I, I'm out, I get a pension, man, I, if I have both my legs and, you know, I, I, I'm still alive, that would be a good deal. That's not right. That's not the. That's not what our founders had in mind as a citizen army, and it's not what uh, what we should be doing. When the army that I served in had doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs, uh, anybody in it, and we served together. We were equally liable, equally vulnerable to the draft, and God, there were senators, there were representatives, the House of Representatives, people who served in Vietnam came back and knew what it was like. So it's a very far cry from that now, and uh, a lot of people are getting pushed around right and left in this country, in my country. How much surveillance and targeting do you think is happening in terms of those that want to cover these issues, those that want to organize on these issues? Mm -hmm. Um, how much risk do you think is really out there right now? Because there's a lot of talk, particularly around the online digital surveillance. Mm -hmm. Well, there are effective encryption techniques. I think that's something that needs to be stressed right off the bat. Um, and they take uh, NSA or people like that, GCHQ, uh, a lot more time to decrypt. Can they do it? Probably, but it's going to take years probably. 
So that's the first and foremost. Now, the other thing is they collect everything, everything. Uh, they bragged about, you know, we can collect everything, and so we do. It would be irresponsible not to collect everything. <laughs> it's crazy, you know? And, uh, and so everything is collected. Now, you can't listen to everything, and you can't read everything, so it's stored, right? That's where we have this mammoth storage capability in, in out west and so forth. So they can, they can get it. If, if McGovern steps out of line, all they need is a little keyword, and they, get, uh, and, they, and they get whatever they need on McGovern. Uh, and that's not to say it's all that accurate or can be made yeah. inaccurate, right? Yeah. Okay. So the thing that, um, that bothers me most is that a lot of people in my country say, well, I got nothing to hide. You know, I'm like Caesar's wife, you know. Well, when Snowden told the world what was going on, someone had the presence of mind to talk to Wolfgang Schmidt from the uh, Stasi, from the East German uh, service. They, you know, they, you probably saw that film, that wonderful film, that's, uh, what was it? Uh, East German Stasi film, <clears throat> Das Leben der Anderen, the, the, the Lives of Others. Anyhow, uh, they asked Wolfgang Schmidt, was a light colonel, lieutenant colonel in, in the Stasi. What do you say to people who say they have nothing to hide? Do you know what? <laughs> he says, this is very naive, very naive. The reason they collect this stuff is because they get to decide how to use it. It's the only way to prevent it from being used against you is to prevent it from being collected in the first place. <laughs> it was beautiful, you know? And, and none of our legislators have had the guts to say, we want to prevent it from being collected in the first place, not only because the danger is there, but because if you build a haystack bigger and bigger, you're never going to find the needle underneath it. And the reason there have been so many terrorist attacks that have been possible is because everybody's listening or watching or doing fish, and nobody's per pursuing mm -hmm. the, the traditional detective techniques. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's very, very odd uh, that uh, this is going on. But, of course, there's a lot of money in it. And after 9-11, uh, the money came so big that, yeah, we can do it, we'll do it. And even if it's not effective, even if it's unconstitutional, which this is, we'll do it. You mentioned earlier the tensions that are happening right now as we speak in relation to particularly the US and Russia and what may be called a proxy war in the Middle East and particularly Syria. Can you, I, I think the average person is struggling to understand what the hell is going on in Syria. Mm -hmm. Could you help explain that for us? Sure. Well, what most the, what, what the ordinary person doesn't know is what they don't read in the media or don't see on TV. You can't talk about Syria and U.S. policy towards Syria without mentioning the word Israel, okay? But why do I say that? Well, why did President Obama and Secretary of State Clinton say five, six years ago, Assad's got to go, he's got to go? I mean, uh, Bashar al-Assad uh, in Damascus is a threat to the United States? I don't think anybody's making that case, right? So why has it got to go? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Israel feels that as long as there's bedlam, chaos in Syria, they have nothing to fear from Syria. Worse still, or better still for their purposes, if there's bedlam in Syria, then Iran and other people can't resupply Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, and so their, near, their threat from near abroad, the people who gave them a bloody nose just three or four years ago, Hezbollah, uh, will be deprived of their weaponry and their support. And then you get back at Iran this way. And all kinds of... So let me just shorten it and say, this is not McGovern speaking, okay? This is the Israeli officials that were approached by the bureau chief of the New York Times um, in early September uh, 2013. And it got to the front page of the New York Times, okay? And what was it? Jody Ruderin was the reporter, and she said, you know, all the stuff about Syria, I think I'll go ask the, ask the uh, Israeli officials what their preferred outcome is. And so she did. And one of them, Alan Pinkas, who had been the uh, 
consul general in New York and several of the others, he said, well, uh, you know, this is, doesn't sound quite right, but, but uh, candidly, the, our preferred outcome is no outcome. And she said, Traguise, uh, si vous play. I mean, uh, hello, no outcome. Yeah, it's, again, I don't think it sounds right, but look, um, we, we look at it as a playoff game where you don't want either team to win. You don't want either team to lose either, but as long as Sunni and Shia are at each other's throats, not only in Syria, but in the whole area, Israel has nothing to fear from Syria. So where does Russia come into play here? Well, the Russians decided that they would uh, contend what they see as a, with uh, a, a growing threat to Russia. Now, you know about Chechnya, you know about a lot of the dissidents, a lot of the Islamic terrorists uh, in southern Russia. So there are about 3,000 of them now in Syria. <laughs> uh, well, what are they getting? They're getting really good training. They're getting really good weaponry. They're getting a lot of financial support. And they're going to be really, really good terrorists when this thing is over. Where are they going to go? They're going to go back home, right? So it, one, one of the short answers is that Vladimir Putin has skin in this game that we don't. We've got an ocean, we've got a Mediterranean Sea, you know, we've got some sort of marginal threat, but he's got a real threat. So he wanted to say, look, and he did say this to our president at the end of September last year at the UN, he said, look, we're not really impressed by how you're going after these terrorists. We think that you're unwilling to face up to the Saudis and the people from Qatar and, and the UAE. You know, they're supplying it. You know, this. You know you're know, you not doing anything. So just to let you know, uh, we're going to go in there and do the job, and we really like to do it together. Now, Obama, to his credit, said, that makes sense. And he had John Kerry, his Secretary of State, get together with Sergei Lavrov, and they worked it out. Well, they tried to work it. At least they de deconflicted the fights over Syria. And then since the late September until last month, okay, well, last month, actually, so June, they worked out a situ situation where they could have a ceasefire, right? Ceasefire, partial ceasefire. That was on the 9th of September. Excruciating negotiations and invoking the name of both Putin and Obama. In other words, they were right behind this. An agreement on the 9th of September it went into effect on the 12th of September. Aleppo would be able to, people would be able to leave, resupplies would be able to come in. What happens? Five days later, on the 17th of September, the U.S. Air Force bombs the hell out of a fixed serious Syrian army position there for six months on top of a big hill killing between 60 and 80 Syrian troops and wounding hundreds of others. So what did that do? That scuttled the ceasefire. Well, why is that important? Well, because if I'm Mr. Putin, I say, who's running? Who's running U.S. policy? Uh, President Obama or the military? Uh, is the military powerful enough to, to countervail, to, to counter to counter the president's, uh, well, it looks like they are. And that's very dangerous because if Putin doesn't trust uh, the president of the United States to be able to live up to his promises, which is what this involves, and if he can't trust the U.S. military to do sensible things, uh, we are on the edge of a real crisis here. So there, there, there's no doubt that we live in very testing times. Um, there's so much despair in the world. Just to wrap up, can I ask you, Ray, where do you find hope in the world these days? Well, um, I see a lot of little things. I, I hang around with people who uh, are driven by hope and by, uh, by expectations, not unrealistic. Uh, we've faced situations like this before, but <clears throat> in some sense it's academic because I go by the adage that the that the good is worth doing because it's good, right? That uh, when you engage in protest activities or when you try to raise consciousness, uh, you have to prescind from the notion that you're gonna be successful, right? Successful is not what you're trying to do. You're trying to be faithful, right? Okay. Now, is success unimportant? No, no, it's not unimportant, but it's secondary, right? It's secondary to the goodness of the act. And so when I go to prison, you know, 
uh, the act, the goodness of the act, I think, speaks for itself to those who are willing to open their minds to, to realize that the drone base that I was demonstrating in front of is killing people, killing people without any real, real reason. And so, and so there's hope there. And, uh, you know, I want my grandchildren to be able to say, well, hey, Grandpa, you, you work for the CIA, you know? What, what's it like to torture people? I want to be able to say, look, I had nothing to do with that. Here's what I did. Let me tell you what I tried to do. Thanks very much, Ray. It's been a pleasure talking to you. You're most welcome. Thank you for listening to the Love and Courage podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I'd really love if you could subscribe to the podcast, rate it and review it and spread the word on social media and wherever you can. While I love doing these interviews, they take a lot of time and effort in research, production, post-production and publicity, and there are some costs involved. If you would like to chip in and help the podcast grow, it would be really appreciated. All contributions welcome and monthly patrons can receive a Love and Courage t-shirt, badge, special mentions online and discounts on future workshops and events. And this support helps me to help others in the community in my day-to-day work. My sincere thanks to all of you who have already supported in so many different ways. Also, just to say, I sometimes take on social change media, communications campaigns and strategic projects and do talks and presentations, workshops at schools and colleges, community centres and at conferences. Topics range from mental health and personal development to youth and community empowerment, leadership, activism and social innovation. If you're interested in learning more about any of this, please let me know. So to get in touch, to offer feedback or suggestions or to make a financial contribution right now, log on to loveandcourage.org or send me an email to podcast at loveandcourage.org. Thank you so much for all your support. Until next time, here's to you, to all of us and to having the courage to create big change in our lives and in the world around us.